welcome to the Forestry England podcast. My name's Bex. I'm travelling up and down the country visiting some of the nation's most beautiful forests, and I'm unearthing some surprising stories along the way. This week, we're heading to Suffolk, to Thetford Forest near Cambridge, to find out all about the intricacies of forest planning. We're chatting to Ellie, one of Forestry England's forest planners, about planting for the future. You know, big data stuff <laughs> um, and incredibly detailed information that allows you to make much more intelligent decisions about what's going on in the forest. And we'll be chatting to Naomi and Chris about the past. Thetford has had a long involvement with forest research. The very first trial planted at Thetford, it's called Thetford One, planted in 1931. It's still there. Plus, Adam has finally found his spiritual home, Thetford Forest's sound trail. Filled with instruments, we're remixing these into a beat. Eighteen thousand seven hundred and thirty hectares. Thetford Forest is so huge that you can see it from space. It's neatly nestled between RAF Lake and Heath, RAF Barnum, and RAF Honington. Uh, Thetford Forest is not just home to flora; it's also home to some F-35s. It's almost impressive, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. But you can see it, it's coming. <laughs> so we began wandering around the Heritage Trail and chatting to Forestry England's Head of Forest Planning. It's a big role. Luckily, Ellie's local. Well, I'm not. I mean, I, I actually, um, I grew up an, an hour or so uh, away, um, but I've been hit living around here for about seven or eight years now. So um, I know it's a little bit, but there's, <laughs> there's still a huge amount more to learn. I feel like it's the kind of place where you'll always find something new. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And there's a, it's a huge landscape. It's about... Um, 18,000 hectares, um, so it's vast. If you look at it on a map, um, you'll see that it's a huge green blob. You can, If you zoom out to the whole of the UK, you can still see it as this big green blob <laughs> in East Anglia. So it is really big um, and definitely um, you know, lots still to learn, lots of corners still to, to walk through and, and discover. Uh, so tell me, Ellie, a little bit about Thetford. How, how long has it been here for? So Thetford was planted just after the First World War. So it's actually a relatively young forest in forestry terms, just, uh, just over 100 years old, um, which when you think about the lifetime of a tree, <laughs> um, which can live for hundreds of years, is really very immature. Um, so, so why was it actually planted here in the first place? Because that is quite recent. Yeah, so um, the Forestry Commission was established just after the First World War with the sole purpose, really, of creating a strategic timber reserve because um, we'd, as a country, we'd used a lot of our um, uh, timber resource. We'd cut down a lot of our trees in the war effort. Um, so a lot of our forests um, were created, were planted um, in that short period, in the, in the decades immediately following the First World War. So a lot of our, particularly our big forests, are really young um, and immature um, and in that kind of adolescent period, if you like. <laughs> um, and um, But we're now thinking about how can we make sure that they reach maturity and go through and become older, more mature, um, beautiful forests that are fit for the next 50, 100, um, 200 years um, uh, to come. Tell me, the trees we're walking through now then, how old would these trees be? Well, the, this bit that we're walking through now in particular um, is coarse compine, and these will have been planted specifically to um, create a timber crop. Mm -hmm. So these ones that we're walking through were probably about 40 years old. Oh, right. So these are, these are even younger. Yeah. Um, so these might be on their second rotation. Um, so there'll have been trees planted, in, in the first rotation, mm -hmm. they'll have been felled and then replanted, um, and then this will be that, that second rotation of trees. I see, because I've seen a few tree stumps, and yeah. yes, obviously everything's being cut and managed as it goes. Exactly, yeah. But all the trees that are felled are always restocked, um, so they're never felled and then not replaced. Um, but that's all part of the way that we plan and manage our forests. And sometimes they're felled in bigger groups, if you like, which is called a clear fell. Um, other times it's um, felled in a more selective way, so you're just taking one or two trees at a time spread over a bigger area, um, and um, that's kind of a more continuous system. 
the, the best way that I've had it described to me is um, it's a bit like sitting in the middle of a spider's web. Um, so you have all these different threads that you're trying to, to that are pulling on your attention, right. that you're trying to, to balance. So maybe the one thread is about um, recreation. Um, and the needs of people who are visiting your forest. Mm -hmm. um, one thread might be about timber production and, the, and how you're going to make sure that you're managing that in a sustainable way across the forest. Um, another thread could be about wildlife conservation and making sure that you're um, managing habitats in a, in a good way so that um, you're enhancing the value of nature across forests and, and so on. You know, Increasingly, there might be threads about things like flooding maybe you've got a forest in a really in a in a landscape that provides really important flood protection for local residents and so on so there's all these different threads that you're thinking about <laughs> that your forest is really important for and as a forest planner you're like the spider in the middle <laughs> with all these things pulling on your attention <laughs> and you've got to understand how to balance them and how your forest is going to deliver all these different things um, so it's a really exciting job it's a really important job um, and you've got to do that and make sure it's done sustainably make sure that um, that forest is fit for the future and is going to continue to deliver against all these objectives in the long run. I love that because when you when I heard you know forestry planner I was like do, do forests need to be planned because yeah. they're just there <laughs> yeah, of course exactly. there are so many things you have to think about to make them work for everybody. Yeah exactly there's all these different objectives um, and all these different requirements and and often the needs of say timber versus recreation might be quite different mm -hmm. so you've got to think about where you balance it, where you put these different things in different parts of the forest, what tree species you plant, when, how you might fell things. And, and that's all quite a complicated process. You've got to balance all of that. Um, and obviously then there's, there's a lot of really important things that we do as part of that, like go out to consultation across um, for the different plan areas so that the public have opportunity to view those. So yeah, our planners are incredibly skilled people <laughs> um, and, uh, and have brilliant jobs um, and, and do a fantastic job at making sure that our forests are um, well thought through and, um, and will be here and fit and thriving in future years. Well, yeah, speaking of future years, I mean, obviously this is a quite a young forest, but as it approaches, I don't know, tree adolescence, as it, as yes. it gets older and older. Yeah. So tell me, when it comes to forests, how do you actually future-proof them? There's obviously a huge amount that we need to think about when um, trying to future-proof our forests. Mm. Um, we're at this time of incredible change, and that's only going to become much more rapid over the coming years. So the first thing, obviously, is environmental change, um, climate change being first and foremost. So we need to think about not just the fact that the average climate is changing, so the fact that... Um, for example, it's going to become much hotter and wetter generally, yeah. but also that there's going to be much greater extremes. So, for example, much more intense droughts, much more frequent um, storms. Mm -hmm. So we need to think about how our trees are going to be able to withstand those extremes as well as the, the changing um, in average temperatures and, and conditions as well. Um, but also climate change can bring with it um, increasing pests and disease. Um, so if you think, you may have heard of things like ash dieback and Dutch elm disease, if you think um, 50 years or so ago, um, we're getting more and more and more pests and diseases that are affecting our, um, our trees, unfortunately. And unfortunately, they're just accumulating. We're not kind of solving any of those tree pest diseases. Um, uh, that's partly caused by climate change, which are, which are creating the conditions that are, enable those pests and diseases to travel north, to travel and colonise um, in, in the UK, but also things like increasing globalisation as well. Um, so that's problems that, more problems that our trees are facing. Um, but then there's also other things as well, like um, social change. Um, so we need to think about making sure that our forests are providing for the needs of society as well. Um, if you think back in time, we, the timber that we produce from our forests may have been 
um, oak for our ships <laughs> or pit props for our mines. We don't need that anymore. So what's the timber that we're going to be producing for future? It might be alternatives to plastic, um, for example. So, um, you know, what are the demands that the, that the public need? And increasingly, for example, we're recognising the extraordinary, extraordinary health and well-being benefits from our forests um, that's, that's rising up the agenda. So there are all these changes that are going on in society and, and our needs from our forests and that our forests themselves are having to adapt to. So we need to think about how we're going to make sure that our forests are fit for that future and are going to be providing for society in the future as well. And there's a lot that we can do to future-proof those forests. We can increase the tree species diversity. We can increase the, the structural diversity, so the, the age classes. We can increase the genetic diversity. We can increase the diversity across the landscape as well. And basically the principle is spread your eggs into as many different baskets because <laughs> the future is pretty uncertain. Sure. Um, so in the past, we perhaps had um, all of our eggs into a few quite good baskets. So for example, here in Thetford Forest, um, we've been walking past a lot of coarse pine, which was brilliant because it was fast growing. It produced really good timber. But unfortunately, it... Um, it caught a fungal pathogen, which was called red band needle blight, um, and that spread really rapidly across the forest, um, and that had really significant implications for the forest and, and, and its growth. Um, and so the team here have been doing some amazing work now to respond to that problem and to diversify um, and to make sure that the forest in future doesn't have the same problems. So. Um, there's a lot that we already have been doing and a lot that we can do in the future, but also doing things like making sure that the, the tree species that we plant are suitable for future climates as well. So it'll mean selecting a lot of species that we are very familiar with, but also some species that perhaps um, uh, come from Northern Europe, for example, that might be um, suited to climates that we're expecting to see in the future. It's interesting then, it's kind of like practical stuff of like literally planting different trees and stuff, yeah. but also presumably technology to figure out what will happen next and yeah. planning the future as well. Absolutely, yeah. So um, we recently did a horizon scan, which was very forward thinking and it's all about um, using foresight to try to detect emerging trends. Mm -hmm. So. Um, understanding what are the sorts of things that might become really important in the future. Um, and it detects um, potential opportunities. It also detects some potential threats that we might need to be aware of. But one of the things that that Horizon scan um, highlighted was technological change. Things like drones, things like remotely operated machinery, things like remote sensing, so satellites or using planes that can um, fly over a forest and tell you the health of a forest or tell you really detailed information about um, the height of individual trees and how they're growing and what species they are. So, you know, big data stuff <laughs> um, and incredibly detailed information that allows you to make much more intelligent decisions about what's going on in the forest, yeah. how you're managing it, and what you should, you should perhaps do in the future. Yeah, presumably stuff that before would have been literally on the ground work, but now you yes. can really get a big picture absolutely. version of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and much more nuanced understanding of how things are changing. You know, literally second by second, almost live, um, understanding of how things are responding as well to environmental change, for example. Um, and yeah, that's, it's really quite extraordinary. Is it something Forestry England are quite dedicated to as well? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, the team here at Thetford bought a drone six months or so <laughs> ago, um, and they're doing some really exciting stuff um, with that already. So um, we're definitely keen to explore and understand how we can help it to, to say, help us make much more intelligent, more smart decisions about what we're doing um, and how we can make better decisions. I really love what Ellie said there about being a spider and her web being the forest as a whole. It echoes what Gareth said in the last episode too, about the forest being this massive balancing act. 
And on that note, it's a good time to remind you that if you want to support Forestry England and amazing people like Ellie, who continue to ensure that our forests can survive and thrive into the future, why not consider a Forestry England membership? As well as putting a vote in the box for the future of our forests, did you know that membership covers the whole household? Meaning that whether it's cycling, running, meandering, or maybe even forest bathing, the whole family have reasons to visit forests regularly for whatever they love doing. Find out more about becoming a member at the end of this episode. So in a minute, we're going to meet Naomi and Chris, who are going to talk about the many methods foresters use to manage and map the future. But first, Adam's gone for a wander around another one of Thetford's trails. Thetford Forest's got its very own sound trail. It's a collection of instruments out in the open for kids and bigger kids to play with. You can actually faintly hear these instruments in the breeze. This part of the podcast is all about finding something that makes sound and making the most of it. So I wandered around Thetford Forest's sound trail. It's at High Lodge and I bashed some of their instruments. They're fun to play with, but I'm pretty sure we can make something a bit more special with them. I took these recordings back to my studio and plumbed them through some software that I have. Sounds like Squid Game. Oh, you're not supposed to hit that bit. Fine. <laughs> from Ellie about planning for the future and that is super important but all of that future planning relies on stuff we've done in the past from the lessons and experiments of earlier foresters so I sat down to speak with Chris and Naomi Chris is a tree species silviculturalist which means he's in charge of growing and cultivating trees and Naomi is an open habitat project manager all right okay so we've got two big jobs going on here um so, Naomi, tell me, uh, what is your work in Thetford? You're part of the Forest Resilience Programme, is that right? The Forest Resilience Programme in Thetford, it's a very grand sounding title, um, but this is a really big piece of work, um, obviously based in Thetford Forest, which um, is obviously the, the UK's largest lowland pine forest sitting in Norfolk and Suffolk. And just to kind of give, give people listening a sense of scale, I love the fact that um, you can go onto Google Maps and if you turn on satellite view, you can quite clearly see Thetford Forest all the way from space. So um, Thetford Forest is 19,000 hectares, so it's absolutely huge. Um, So that gives a sense of the scale we're working on. Um, And in terms of resilience, I'm sure Ellie has spoken about this in the first part of the podcast. But the idea behind resilience is being able to sort of withstand or adapt to external changes. Um, And I I quite like thinking about this sort of almost thinking about our bodies and our minds, thinking that really a sort of healthy body and healthy mind equals a resilient body. We're we're more able to adapt and withstand external changes. And it's a similar sort of concept with with a forest as well, really. So the programme is thinking about what can we do to make sure that Thetford Forest is a healthy forest in the future. Um, And that's made up of of lots of different things that that we're considering. But one of the the key concepts really um, within sort of creating a healthy forest is thinking about diversity. Um, But essentially the programme is thinking about how can we create diversity within Thetford Forest on multiple different scales. So we're looking all the way from the individual tree scale. So thinking about different species, but also where have those trees actually come from in the world? How are they adapted well to uh, the local climate we'll be planting it in? 
um, all the way through to sort of structural diversity. So ensuring that we have a mixture of different ages of trees as well as species. And then right sort of the biggest, biggest scale is habitat diversity. So thinking about a forest, we have trees in the forest, but we also have habitats which are more open as well as uh, water courses. So rivers, um, maybe wetland areas as well. So we're really thinking about how can we make Thetford uh, resilient? And that is underpinning it all is that that concept of diversity. So the idea is to create a sort of long term plan over at least the next 50 years for how we can increase diversity in Thetford Forest on all those different scales. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a, a sense of what we're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you did mention there the size of Thetford Forest. I have been to Thetford and it is massive. And I guess that means for you as well, that's a big canvas for you to work from, right? Yeah, definitely. It gives us the opportunity to trial lots of different things, which is absolutely great that we can test different things and, and monitor how it goes um, and then be able to, to learn from that. Um, and I think it also provides a really great opportunity that we're working at a landscape scale. So the impacts that we can have will be really significant, both for the climate in terms of carbon capture, but also for wildlife in particular, which I'm sure we'll touch on later, um, working at a landscape scale to provide for a whole range of, of different species. So, yeah, it provides loads of great opportunities for us to, to experiment with different things. Busy all time. And Chris, tell me, so we're talking about Thetford, so a bit more of a, a local level, but you're doing this nationally as well. Does, does what uh, Naomi said uh, sound familiar to you? Have you have you fa faced these challenges as well? It, this is a, a, a national issue. You know, we have forests that are under threat, that are under stress. And we've only got a very small number of native species and a relatively small number of productive species, those that we need to, to buy, supply timber, uh, paper, etc. So, you know, a big part of the challenge is to make sure we've got forests here in the future. So, you know, Thetford is one of those sites that I do a lot of work in, um, and it's really quite handy um, having Thetford because it covers the whole aspect of looking for new tree species. Um, you can think of places like Linford Arboretum, which is a, a wonderful little tree collection, but that's where research starts. If a tree is growing well there, and it's been there for a long time, it has the potential then maybe to become a forestry species, so planted in large numbers. And if you go, you know, if you look back, I mean, Thetford has had a long involvement with forest research. The very first trial planted at Thetford, called Thetford One, strange enough, is, um, was planted in 1931, and it's a species trial. It's still there. So this is not a new process. We're not coming at this cold. We're looking at you know a whole range of these trials planted since the 1930s, early days of the Forestry Commission, and you know we're, we're drawing on that wealth of knowledge and and a wealth of sites. And Thetford's really lucky; it's got a huge number of these old trials which we can revisit, and they're telling us stories. They're helping us to identify potential species for the future. And then from that, of course, I can then set up new trials. And new trialing is continuous. The issue is that I won't be here to see the results of the trials I'm putting in. They take time. But my job is to put that scientific rigor in there to bring all that information together so that if we are suggesting something that could be planted, um, to replace something like Corsican pine. Corsican pine is the main productive species in Thetford, and it's been affected by disease. Um, which is a thing called Dothystroma needle blight, which um, can kill, but generally just reduces how productive that tree is. So it suddenly it doesn't become a useful forestry species. So what I'm looking for, of course, is something to replace that, that will give us saw logs, that will give us pulp and paper, all those things we use every day. So these are the kind of challenges facing the forest that you have to prepare for, I guess, and try and figure out ways to, to fix um, for the future. Oh, exactly. Yeah. So you know, the two key things that are, um, are coming our way is a lack of diversity within our forestry species. Um, also, you know, climate change, of course, and pests and diseases. Um, now, the climate change, in some ways, we can we, we can work towards. We have a better understanding of what's likely to happen. So I can start looking for those species that are likely to be better adapted, especially you know, for the Thetford area, for hotter, drier environment in the future. Pest and diseases is, is a bit more of a problem. The way things are happening is as things warm, it becomes better for some things. 
So we're, uh, you know, it, that's what we call horizon scanning. We're always looking across to the continent and around the world and saying, well, what's happening elsewhere? And could that be a problem here if we don't do something or we're not cautious about how we introduce a new tree species? I like the idea of horizon scanning. Um, Naomi, tell me, are the trees in Thetford, are they kind of going to change over the next 50 years? Do you reckon that's something you can see from horizon scanning, from looking around? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, there have already been significant changes, I'd say, in the types of trees that that we're planting in Thetford and sort of how well they're doing and how well suited they are to, to the soils and the environment at Thetford. There's a really great statistic, which I love quoting, um, which is that up until sort of the early 1990s, about 80% of what we were planting was Corsican pine. But now we're planting over 40 different species. And the proportion that we're planting those species in is uh, only going to, to increase. So we already have these different forest management techniques, which will allow us to plant this wider variety of species and add in that diversity, add in that resilience in terms of our timber supply, but also in terms of the, the habitats that we're creating as well. Well, yeah, speaking of the future, like what do you expect that look like? If you were to come back to the same forest of Thetford in 50 years, what, what do you think you would notice as being a big change? I think it'll be the sheer number of different uh, types of tree, different species. There'll be a textural difference when you look at it. At the moment, you've got pine as like the canvas. Uh, but what you've got now is the opportunity to put to paint a different picture, to get a whole range of different species there, different textures, different colours. Use them as, as landscape trees as well. You know, just basically make sure the tree's healthy, the, the trees are resilient, it's the right trees on the right place to make sure that we're not planting things that aren't going to survive in the future. So, yeah, so what we're hoping, like I say, or what we want to achieve is make sure that we've still got trees there that are growing strongly, but also produce those needs we have. Um, and they will be different. There'll be a far more mixed range of species. Instead of plantations of one as a monoculture that often are felled and then replanted, we'll probably be looking at a lot more woodlands that will never actually be truly clear felled what we call continuous cover. So younger younger trees of a wide range of ages growing alongside each other and with each other. I'm just fascinated by this because just thinking you say, was it the 1931 you said the trees had been planted? Yeah. I'm just wondering if the forester from then could see what happened to the forest now. Um, what do you think the difference would be for them? Well, what I love is when you, I love looking back through dusty old files and being a research scientist. We have lots of those. Um, <laughs> I, I, there was a trial established in 1964, and I've seen the names on there. They're like the, the gods of forestry when I see the names on these files. And they were worried about the over-reliance of Corsican pine in Thetford. This is back in the 60s. And they said, well, one of the things we've got to think about is how do we establish a wider range of species, but bearing in mind frost, cold is a big issue over there establishing trees, um, and uh, various pests and diseases. So they established a series of trials across Thetford where they thinned, heavily thinned Corsican pine plantations and then underplanted them. I saw a lovely letter in one of them where someone had ranked. They said, right, I think in the first five years, these will be the top. Then the, in year 10, these will be the top front runners. And by year 20, these will be the front runners. And someone had written a little note at the bottom saying, anybody want to put some money on this? <laughs> and they were pretty, pretty much spot on. I like the idea they were betting on trees, which one would yeah. thrive. I love this. This is amazing. Yeah. And uh, Naomi, it, it must be quite nice to know that like, you're carrying on this tradition, right? You've got people who cared for Thetford in the past and you're doing it now and then you, you hand it forward in the future, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think um, that's it's part of the excitement of it, really, that you're planning on such long time scales. Um, but it's also part of the, the exercise of patience that it is as well. Um, but yeah, it's is wonderful, as, as Chris says, to, to be able to go back to these species trials, which have been set up decades ago and um, see kind of how what the foresters were thinking and um, learn from from obviously what they've set up. So, yeah, that's very much why the plan we're drawing together is at least a 50 year plan. And that's sort of just the transition plan almost to, um, yeah, to what it might look like. Um, but all of our forest plans are done on a on a 10 year cycle. So, yeah, I mean, every, every forest plan that's done, we're already thinking a decade, if not further ahead. Oh, that was 
was fascinating, wasn't it? And Chris talking about those historic documents. It just goes to show you that we're always learning and constantly trying new things in the quest to protect the nation's woodlands. Thanks for listening to the Forestry England podcast. This episode was all about forest planning for the future. It was produced and edited by Adam Stoner with help from Rebecca Small. Research by Kieran Snedden and Dominic Head. My name is Bex Lindsay. Next week, we're off to Cannock Chase, just north of Birmingham. A modern way of looking at a forest and planning a forest is that it's a mosaic of permanent spaces with open space of water, trees, which will be there forever, be really great habitat. And then there's other places which are the spaces where we grow trees that will harvest for timber. That voice belongs to James. We've been chatting a lot about trees, but it's time to find out what they're actually used for. The next episode is all about timber and the climate crisis. We always replant what we've taken away, unless the objective for that piece of the forest has changed. If you've loved this episode, why not take out a Forestry England membership? Whether you're looking to smash that Couch to 5K routine or just want somewhere incredible to take the kids on the weekends, there's literally no place like the forest. And membership is such a good way to support the amazing work that Forestry England do to care for the nation's forests. Their future is our future too. You can find out more about membership at forestryengland.uk and check out the show notes for a whole host of information on different ways that you can spend your weekend in that great green outdoors. See you soon.